Good morning and welcome to worship. I look forward every week to this service and being able to worship with each one of you. In a world of uncertainty and concerns, Sunday mornings and the ability to worship with my church family still give me a sense of normalcy and consistency. My mother told me that she often forgets which day of the week it is because they're at home so much. But she never forgets Sunday because she has the service to look forward to, the worship and the fellowship with each of you. So welcome to worship. I was reminded this week of several things from my childhood that shaped my spiritual life. One of them was being a teenager and having what I thought was a critical decision to make and not knowing the right choice. My parents asked me if I'd prayed about it, and I said, well, of course I'd prayed about it, but God hadn't given me an answer. And then they spoke to me about Section 9 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which reads, Behold, you have not understood. You have supposed that I would give it unto you when you took no thought, save it was to ask me. But behold, I say unto you, that you must study it out in your mind. Then you must ask me if it be right, and if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore you shall feel that it is right. But if it is not right, you shall have no, no such feelings, but you shall have a stupor of thought that shall cause you to forget that thing which is wrong. So I did exactly what my parents suggested, and... I made a list of pros and cons. I studied it out in my mind. I prayed about it. And I woke up the next morning and 
I truly could only remember one of the choices. I had a stupor of thought about the second. You see, I had just expected that God was going to give me the answer and that I didn't have to do anything for it. I think we do that sometimes with prayer. I think sometimes we even use prayer as an excuse when someone asks us to do something. Well, I'll pray about it. I'll think about it. But do we truly study it out in our minds? Do we truly prepare ourselves for prayer and for the Lord himself? If we're serious about making Christ's mission ours, then we need to do more than put the onus on God to do the hard work. We need to prepare, to study things out, to pray, and then to listen. Because sometimes the things that God says are surprising. Sometimes those things throw a wrench in our plans and disrupt the flow of our everyday lives. Or at least what we think our everyday lives should look like. But our preparation is critical. It is in preparing that we become the people that God created us to be. And that brings me to the second thing that I remember so vividly from my childhood. And that's sitting around the campfire at Bluff Springs Campgrounds and singing the song Pass It On. It only takes a spark. And indeed, once we have that spark lit inside of us, then we can share the good news of Christ's mission and God's love to all that we meet. Today, let us prepare ourselves for God's plans and truly make Christ's mission ours. Our Father, who art in heaven. Years ago, Linda took a class at the Milton Congregation based on a book by Dr. Mark Rudlin called 21 Seconds to Change Your World. It turns out that it takes 21 seconds to pray the Lord's Prayer. And the prayer and the class did change Linda's world. Since then, she has said the prayer in many congregations, in many services. But today, something different will take place. Let's listen in. Our Father, who art in heaven. Yes. Don't interrupt me. I'm praying. But you called me. Called you? No, I didn't call you. I'm praying. Our Father, who art in heaven. There, you did it again. Did what? Called me. You said, Our Father, who art in heaven. Well, here I am. What's on your mind? But I didn't mean anything by it. I was, you know, just saying my prayers for the day I... For the day, I always say the Lord's Prayer. It makes me feel good and kind of fulfilling a duty. Well, all right. Go on. Okay. Hallowed be thy name. Hold it right there. What do you mean by that? By what? By hallowed be thy name. It means, it means, good grief. I don't know what it means. How in the world should I know? It's just part of the prayer. By the way, what does it mean? It means honored, holy, wonderful. Hey, that makes sense. I never thought about what Hallowed meant before. Thanks. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you really mean that? Sure, why not? What are you doing about it? Doing? Well, nothing, I guess. I just think it would be kind of neat if you got control over everything down here like you have up there. We're kind of in a mess down here, you know. Yes, I know. But I've got control of you, don't I? Well, I go to church. That isn't what I asked you. What about your bad temper? You really got a problem there. You know, and then there's the way you spend your money, all on yourself. And what about the kind of books you read? Now, hold on just a minute. Stop 
picking on me. I'm just as good as some of the rest of those people at the church. Excuse me. I thought you were praying for my will to be done. If that is to happen, it will have to start with the ones who are praying for it. Like you, for example. Oh, all right. I guess I do have some hang-ups. Now that you mentioned it, I could probably name some others. So could I. I haven't thought about it very much until now, but I would really like to cut out some of those things. I would like to, you know, be really free. Good. Now we're getting somewhere. We'll work together, you and I. I'm very proud of you. Look, Lord, if you don't mind, I need to finish up here. This is taking a lot longer than I usually does. Give us this day our daily bread. You need to cut out the bread. You're overweight as it is. Hey, wait a minute. What is this? Here I was doing my religious duty, and all of a sudden, you break in and re remind me of all my hang-ups. Praying is a dangerous thing. You just might get what you ask for. Remember, you called me, and here I am. It's too late to stop now. Keep praying. Well, go on. I'm scared to. Scared of what? You know what you'll say. Try me. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. What about Carol? See, I knew it. I knew you'd bring her up. Why, Lord, she's told lies about me, spread stories. She's never paid back the money she owes me. I've sworn to get even with her. But your prayer. What about your prayer? I didn't mean it. Well, at least you're honest. But it's quite a load carrying around all that bitterness and resentment, isn't it? Yes, but I'll feel better as soon as I get even with her. Boy, have I got some plans for her. She'll wish she'd have never been born. No, you won't feel any better. In fact, you'll feel worse. Revenge isn't sweet, you know. You know how unhappy you are? Well, I can change all that. You can? How? Forgive Carol, and then I'll forgive you. And the hate and sin will be in Carol's problem, not yours. You will have settled the problem as far as you are concerned. Oh, you know, you're right. You always are. And more than I want revenge, I want to be right with you. All right, all right. I forgive her. There. Now, wonderful. How do you feel? Hmm. Well, not bad. Not bad at all. In fact, I feel pretty great. You know... I don't think I'll go to bed uptight tonight. I haven't been getting much rest, you know. Yes, I know. But you're not through with your prayer, are you? Go on. Oh, all right. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Good, good. I can take care of that. Just don't put yourself in a place where you can be tempted. What do you mean by that? You know what I mean. Yeah, I know. Okay, go ahead. Finish your prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Do you know what would bring me glory? What would really make me happy? No, but I'd like to know. I want to please you now. And I've really made a mess of things. I want to truly follow you. And I can see how great that would be. So tell me. How do I make you happy? You just did.
Dear Lord, there are those who pray, God of peace, where are you? As nations suffer from this COVID crisis, as people struggle for freedom, empathy, and justice, as cities are torn apart with riots, burning buildings, and chaos, as leaders struggle to offer help, direction, and wisdom, as scientists hasten to create a vaccine that will alleviate, stop, or turn this virus around, as social institutes search to find ways to educate children, worship together, and serve, as economies strain with layoffs, closures, and excessive debt, where are you? We who have faith see you amongst the chaos, the pain, and the struggles. We see your presence and your love in the middle of it all holding us close. We see you at the shoulder of the doctors and nurses guiding their hands and minds. We see you whisper to the leaders with wisdom for those who will hear. We see you guiding the research scientists as the work for a cure. We see you holding in your hands the institutes of learning and worship, cradling the children, the teachers, and the religious leaders, and the faithful, nurturing and protecting. We see you watching, guiding, sharing your wisdom and your comfort with all who will listen and see. Today, we pray for all to see you, to be your hands, your feet. Today, we pray for peace, love, and salvation. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. This morning, our disciples' generous response. This is the fifth week of a generosity cycle. Today, the focus is on the response phase. Many see God in nature, the changing of the seasons, snow falling, melting, and falling again, the sun rising, setting, and rising again each day. Rhythm, flow, intentional movement from one phase to another, a never-ending cycle of grace and generosity. It is this flow and rhythm that you're invited to explore through the generosity cycle, an invitation to pause and reflect, to create space in our lives for a spiritual discipline. Periods of time set aside to recognize the grace of God that forms our generous response. Invite, discover, respond, and reflect. Seasons of generosity. Intentional movement from one phase to another. Rhythm, flow. An inward and outward journey that begins and ends with God. Invite, discover, respond, and reflect. You are now invited to explore these elements of the generosity cycle. For the past four Sundays, we have been expressing gratitude for the gifts we have received from a generous God. When we become aware that we are the recipients of God's amazing love and grace, freely given with no strings attached, we want to share those gifts with others. Gratitude shows us the way to generosity. When we understand God's love and grace are given freely to us, it liberates us to share them freely in return. Our ability to be generous 
emerges from the spirit of thank give thankfulness and not burden of indebtedness. God's blessings transform us as we gain a deeper understanding of what God's vision of Shalom is all about and how we can help create it. As disciples, we are called to share those freely given gifts with others. When we respond together, we give shape and form to God's vision of Shalom through faithful and generous living. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, your people, thank you for the blessings of life and of a community, especially during this difficult time that we are all living. We thank you for the gifts we have received from you. So abundantly they have been come. We ask that you guide each one of us to find ways to share those gifts that we have received from you, that we might share them with others. As you love, as your love and your grace are given freely, may we be prompted to do the same. May we give freely. We ask that as we have an opportunity to give, that you take our offering of gifts and that you bless each one of them, that they may be a blessing where needed. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask these things in your most precious holy name, Jesus Christ, amen. Creator of all, as we gather today, we listen to the music radiating from our gathering, our president speaking, prayers being said. We don't have to hear machine gun fire, the fearful cries of children, or the wailing of death in war-torn towns and cities. As we look around, we see the beauty of the day and the solid structure and protection our homes offer us from the world. But do we see the inequality just outside our doors? The darkness experienced by those who are marginalized in society because they are different to what we have come to see as normal? As we choose the smells that surround us, perhaps freshly picked flowers, a quick spray of perfume, or even lunch cooking in the kitchen, may we pause for a moment and think on those living with the smell of poverty, of skin and clothing that hasn't been able to be cleaned, or the rotting of garbage or sewage in the streets, as there is nowhere else to call home. As we wait for this service to be over, have our minds already moved on to the next thing, the meal we will have, the options and possibilities for a simple meal for us? Yet there are so many others in the world who know only the taste of dirt, for there is not enough water to fully wash the dust from their mouths, and food is so scarce that to know the diversity of flavor is simply a dream. They have lost hope and their dreams. As we reflect on the soft feel of a little child's hand in ours, or the spontaneous pressure that comes in an unexpected hug of uncontrolled joy, may we also feel for the mother whose heart is breaking to see her child lost in a political system that doesn't have their best interest at heart or the mother who desperately clings to her child for fear of what momentary separation might mean in a refugee camp. We are sheltered in our experience right here, right now. And while we are grateful for this, Lord, challenge us to see that in the welfare of others resides our own welfare. We need to hear the pleading of our brothers and sisters. We need to be active in providing places where people feel safe and advocating for political change that will honor the lives of all. We can be scared and selfish. We need your help, Lord. Disrupt our comfort and make us brave that we might fight for others in the same way that Jesus stood for the marginalized and oppressed. This is our prayer, Lord that we may use everything you gave us to fight for the rights of others so that together we can exist in harmony and peace. Amen.
Thank you for the invitation to worship with you today. It, it certainly is good to connect with you, even though it's through technology. I know these are stressful times, a global pandemic, economic woes, natural calamities, and a tense national election are just some of the issues that are pressing upon us. As a people of faith, we look to scripture and the Holy Spirit to help us understand how to live in, in times like these. Our scripture text for today, as we explore our theme, prepare for the Lord, is Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. And I'll read that passage for your hearing now. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise said, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Waiting is hard, isn't it? When I was serving as Apostle for Africa, I was invited by one of our Kenyan church leaders to attend his wedding. Guests were told to arrive around 9 a.m. in the morning, and being the punctual American I am, I arrived a few minutes early. I was guided to a seat under a canopy, offered some refreshment, and invited to relax because the wedding party had not arrived yet. Now, delayed starts are not that unusual in Africa because of all the chores that must be done and all the obstacles overcome to gather a group of people in one location for such an event. So I patiently waited and waited. Before long, it was noon the humidity and temperature had risen. I was already sweating through my suit. And people assured me that even though there had been a slight delay, the wedding party would arrive soon. By early afternoon, people were milling about, chatting, and then some began to enter the church building. And I thought to myself, now that's a good sign. They must know something that I don't. Perhaps the arrival of the groom and bride is imminent. So I decided to go ahead into the church too. I sat on a bench, an old wooden bench that really wasn't suited to my anatomy. And I proceeded to wait. And I waited. And I must admit, I began to be a little frustrated. I was hot and a little tired and a little hungry. Eventually, with no sign of the wedding about to begin, I got up and walked back to the guest house where I was staying. I found a snack, I drank some water, I took a little rest. And then afterwards, I went back to the church where 
Surprisingly, a spontaneous choir had formed and begun to sing. Waiting had become meaningful. Waiting had become worship. Waiting had become community building. And I listened to the choruses of praise to God and devotion to Jesus Christ with appreciation. But by now, it was late afternoon, and I waited. Suddenly, the shout went out, they're coming, and there was an excited rustle in the crowd and, and murmurs of approval and anticipation, and some streamed outside to meet the wedding party and caught up in the excitement. I went outside, too. And somewhere along the way, I was told what the problem had been. You see, in African culture, the groom must prove himself worthy of the bride according to his future father-in-law's evaluation and estimation. He must evidence his ability to support her and the highly anticipated family of children to come. In this case, the groom had arrived to pick up the bride in an automobile that the bride's father did not deem worthy of transporting his daughter to the wedding. So he refused to let her leave. Consequently, the groom had spent the day trying to locate a better car that he could borrow. And at last he found a friend who had a high-end brand name import. And he asked with no small degree of desperation to use it. Thankfully, the friend agreed. And the groom returned to the bride's home in the more upscale, respectable car. And the father was impressed and released his daughter to go with the groom to the wedding. But by then, the sun was setting. The wedding service began with a slow processional time to an African drum beat. And the wedding service itself was a beautiful experience. It was a wonderful wedding and, and followed by a great community feast. After everything had ended late at night, I trekked back to my room in the dark and drifted into a deep sleep. What did I learn from that experience? I learned that some things are, are worth waiting for, no matter how long they take. I learned that there are many aspects of our lives and life in general that are beyond our control. I also learned that there are ways of waiting that are increasingly frustrating and ways of waiting that are meaningful and productive. To explore that kind of waiting, the kind of waiting that's meaningful and productive, let's return to our scripture text. This parable of the 10 bridesmaids was offered during a time when speculation about the end of the world was rampant. People were worried about what would happen, when it would happen, and why it had not happened yet. A lot of apocalyptic writings with dramatic graphic images were circulating, fueling fear and speculation that the end was very near. In the small fellowship of followers of Jesus, there was the added element of trying to understand what Jesus meant when he spoke about his imminent death and future return. The parable of the 10 bridesmaids was offered to provide insight regarding all those issues 
and questions. This parable is an allegory. An allegory is a kind of writing used in Scripture to present, uncover, reveal deeper truths. It's not a literal story. An allegory is a story or a poem or a picture that can be interpreted as one explores it under the guidance of the Spirit to reveal deeper meanings. And sometimes there are multiple layers of meaning. The wedding, the bridesmaids, the lamps, the oil, and, and all the other elements of the story are, are symbols that point to important truths. A wedding feast or, or banquet are common symbols for the the coming kingdom or reign of God, which was the constant focus and theme of Jesus's ministry. The bridesmaids represent everyone invited to the wedding. In some versions, bridesmaids is translated more broadly as wedding party. The oil represents anticipation and preparation. The sleep represents becoming distracted, lack of spiritual awareness. The burning lamps represent the spiritual light of faith and hope. So with all of that in mind, what does this parable teach us? There are several possibilities, but the one that I would like to focus on today is that this parable teaches us how followers of Jesus Christ should live in what I call the meantime. And by that, by the phrase meantime, I mean times like the ones in which we're living Times when uncertainty, unpredictability, and worry are rampant. Times in which we can become easily distracted from what is important or discouraged. Also, the meantime refers to the time between now and the coming of a reconciled, restored creation when God will fully dwell with humankind. And pain and sickness and tears and death, according to the scriptural vision of that time, will be no more. Regarding insight into this parable, one scholar states, to refuse to wait would be foolish, for it denies the possibilities of a future outside of one's design. To bring enough oil, now remember that refers to the light of faith and hope, is to be wise. Because the night might be longer or darker than expected. Still, the belief is that morning, morning will come. Waiting is an act of faith. That's great counsel for times like these. This parable is about the mysterious power of Christ-centered hope and and proactive, anticipatory, prepared for the long run faith. This parable insists that the darkness, whatever the darkness may be, is never the last word and does not necessarily have to lead to despair, distraction, or surrender. The light of faith fueled by hope and the Holy Spirit 
can see us through the night. As I was studying this parable, I remembered the familiar campfire song, Give Me Oil in My Lamp. That song is based on this parable. Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning, burning, burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning, burning, burning. Keep me burning to the judgment day. I hope you're not disappointed I didn't sing that song, but I thought it best to simply recite the words. So how do we live in the meantime? Robert McClellan writes, the faithful find courage to live. And this is an important insight. The faithful find courage to live as if the kingdom has already arrived, loving radically and fearlessly. Moreover, as individuals and communities become attuned to the signs of the kingdom, they become increasingly able to participate in its coming by living according to its ways. So this parable is about waiting for the fullness of the coming of the kingdom of God by living in the present now as if the kingdom has already arrived. By doing that, we actually accelerate its arrival. We are prepared for the Lord because we are already living in the Lord. We're living the way of Christ in love and service and generosity and peacefulness. We are living lives in the image of Christ, and he recognizes us by the nature of our lives, devoted to expressing his love, his ministry, and his mission in the world. Skipping ahead in this chapter, Matthew 25, to verses 31 and following, we, we find some added insight. When the waiting is over and the nations of the world are being judged and sorted out, the primary criteria for inheriting the kingdom, according to this passage of Scripture, is found in these words of Jesus. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothes. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Evidently, those who think they are the righteous will be dumbfounded. But those who know the Lord intimately through their lives of Christ-like love and service on behalf of others will enter in to the kingdom. Now that leads me to an aspect of this parable that I struggle with. And, and that's okay, because parables are meant to leave us thinking and pondering and, and trying to connect the dots. They're meant to prod us to go beyond our current thinking and practices. So as I was reflecting on this parable, I took a bit of a journey with it, and I began to wonder and imagine what would have happened if the five bridesmaids who had plenty of oil had shared some of what they had with the others who didn't have enough. Would everybody have had a chance 
the opportunity of, of making it into the banquet. Now, I know some were foolish. I know some did not plan well. But I wonder, what would have happened if the ones well stocked with oil had shared it generously in the spirit of love and mutuality in community. Well, that's just me continuing to explore this parable from different, different angles and perspectives. But bottom line, and in conclusion, a central truth of this parable is clear, and it's applicable in our lives and circumstances today. As we live in the meantime, the in-between time, even if the times are, are difficult and stressful, we can live lives of spiritual alertness, lives of great meaning and purpose by keeping our lamps of faith and hope burning brightly. May it be so for all of us is my prayer. Amen. Lord, prepare Our sending forth prayer today I would like to share with you is that God, the present and of the future, be our eternal God. Send us into a changing world sustained by thy unchanging love. Read into us the sense of mission. Mold us into a people under a divine call to us to be the light of the world. Others will know we are children of God by our love for all people. May we go forth to prepare the way for others to join us in this journey to build the kingdom of God. We go to be the children of God, walking with each other, sharing our concerns, acknowledging each other's worst, all in the precious in the sight of God. The Lord be with us all. Go in peace and love. So let it be. Amen.
I like to do the Lord's Prayer, but before I do, I would like us to form a virtual circle. So if you are in the room with somebody, grab their hand like you're making a circle. Take your other hand and point it towards the screen. If you're by yourself, just point both hands towards the screen. And hopefully we'll have a virtual circle. Pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.